Okay, well, it is 1130. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I can still see many participants continue to join. So um, it's great to see so many of you here this morning. We, of course, wish we could be together in person, but uh, this is not a terrible backup option. Good to see everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. I'm Ann Marburger. I'm the executive director of Padres Build the Cause. Um, and today we kick off our Road to Discovery series um, with a project spotlight on pediatric medulloblastoma research. Um, it is, we have a terrific lineup of three guest speakers from Rady Children's Hospital, whom I will introduce here shortly. Oops. Um, I'm, uh, let's see, I just want to start by sharing that really the goal of today's presentation is to provide our Padres Pedal participants, donors, friends, family members, super kids, um, an opportunity to learn directly the impact of their 2019 fundraising. So no better way to do that than to hear directly from recipients who have been funded by Padres Pedal. Um, I want to also share some context that uh, we have a, a, a wide variety of, of participants and donors on the line. So thanks for being with us. Um, today, I'm going to touch briefly just on some housekeeping, um, and then I'll give a brief update on um, Padres Pedal the Cause and some new programs that we've launched over the past few months, and then we will get to our panelists. Um, so everyone should know that if you've dialed in, um, you are on mute, so um, don't worry about background noise or don't try and ask a question using your audio. Um, we, we plan for 45 minutes of dialogue with our three panelists, and then we'll save 15 minutes of time at the end so you can ask questions um, of our panelists here today. Um, please go ahead and enter your questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, this session is being recorded, and so we can share it afterwards if you want to watch again or share with other people who couldn't make it. Um, and then I also just want to touch on the fact that our staff is monitoring the chat room feature. So if you have any technical issues or general comments, feel free to offer those in the chat right here. And if you want to submit your, your questions, go ahead and type those in here. Feel free to um, enter those at any point in the conversation. We will address those at the end, but um, submit them as the questions arise. All right. I um, so just want to take a second while we have many of you here to share an update on what Padres Pedal the Cause has been doing over the past several months um, to carry forth our mission um, of accelerating cures for cancer. Uh, and so at the end of June, we had a second world without cancer day. Um, I know many of you participated in that. Um, it became a virtual event this year where really we encourage everyone to ride a bike, um, go on a run, do a yoga class, do anything they really wanted to do um, and make a small contribution uh, in honor of those that, that we know who are touched by cancer. So we were really pleased with um, support and engagement on that day and ended up raising $125,000, um, which is great. And that will actually fund another additional research project. Um, another new initiative that we've launched over the past several months is a program called Bushries for Good. Um, and through this program, we're working with the Padres volunteer team and Susan G. Komen and um, our grocery partner, Albertson's Vons, to purchase and deliver groceries to cancer patients at Rady Children's Hospital and, and also at Morris Cancer Center who are currently going through treatment and who are at a higher risk of complications from COVID-19. And so this program is allowing them to stay at home and recover from their treatment and decrease the risk of, of infection. Um, and so we've been able to deliver about 150 bundles so far. Um, and I offer that just to, to raise awareness of the program. Um, certainly if you have any friends or family members who are going through treatment and are undergoing uh, economic hardship right now, um, please feel free to encourage them to visit our website, gopedal.org um, forward slash groceries for good, um, where they can submit interests and need for the program. Our intent is to run this program for the rest of the year. Um, in, in terms of funding cancer research, hopefully you all saw the news that um, we announced funding for nine new grants just in early June. Um, four of those were pediatric grants, and five of them were um, kind of focused on all different types of adult cancers. Um, of course, uh, at the end of this um, presentation, we're going to get to dive into Dr. Crawford's uh, research project that was just funded. Um, and then I just also wanted to highlight, like I said, today is, is the first part of a, a three series webinar. Um, in September, we will hear um, from a collaborative team focusing on lung cancer research. And then later in the month, we'll have an opportunity to hear directly um, from a clinical research team that's focusing on gastrointestinal cancers. So with that, um, I'm really excited to introduce our team from Rady Children's who's here today. We have Dr. Patrick Frias, 
um, the CEO of the Children's Hospital. And we also have Dr. Bill Roberts and Dr. John Crawford. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Frias, for making time to be with us today. Um, in addition to your leadership roles at the hospital, you, of course, um, also stepped into the leadership role of Team Ready Children's and participated in our event last year. I know that you and your wife uh, did a spin class on the field, so um, thanks so much for your support. Um, Dr. Frias is going to give us a general update on some exciting initiatives that are happening at Brady Children's Hospital, along with a look at how COVID-19 is impacting care. Um, so with that, Dr. Frias, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ann. Good morning, everybody. And yes, I did spin. I could not walk for about a week after that. So you'll be proud to know I actually started cycling. So we'll see next year whether I'm going to be on a spin or on a real bike going forward. So and thank you Excellent. for the opportunity to, for Rady Children's to be part of this exciting uh, webinar. I also want to start by thanking Bill and Amy Komen for their incredible support of Rady Children's through Padres Pedal the Cause. And Bill and Amy were just trailblazers creating this opportunity to eradicate cancer, but also build a community and through partnerships and making sure that we're all working together for this one goal that we all share, curing cancer for the kids. And thanks as well to all those on the Padres Pedal Board and to Ann Marburger and you, for your support and all the work you're doing and adapting here during COVID-19 is phenomenal. You know, we've, as you said, we received some grants here through this and you'll hear more about it in a little bit. Overall, we've received 19 grants through Padres Pedal the Cause, totaling $1.7 million. And right now, as we sit through the, uh, our, our pandemic, I do want to share a little bit. I'd be remiss to not say anything about COVID-19 and what it's done at Rady Children's. Thankfully, kids have not been very impacted by COVID-19. We have had a few dozen admitted, but we still have to be prepared for every child that comes to our doors and treat every asymptomatic child as if he or she may have an infection. So we have the PPE and the screening and you name it. And at the end of the day, though, we have to be ready to make sure that we're here to care for the kids with cancer and other diseases because those incidents, the incidents of those diseases are not going away. So we're here every day care for the kids with cancer. And as you see on this slide, not only are we caring for cancer, not only are we uh, recipients of your, of your generous funding, but we're also fundraisers, as Ann mentioned. And we're real proud to be, be part of the, the team and, and help raise the funds for all. And we all want to thank each of you who've been involved in Ride for a Child, where, where teams can come together and support a child who's going through this difficult journey of cancer and, and know that there are others in the community that are with them and battling. And you can see here all that we've received over the years. If you go to the next slide, you know, Ray, I want to show here, Rady Children's is, is committed to discovering treatments and cures for childhood cancer. And we have our affiliation, of course, with UCSD School of Medicine and the Morris Cancer Center. But we also do have research and partnership with institutions such as Sanford Burnham Previs and the Salk Institute and ensuring that children can benefit from the best science and basic clinical and translational research and benefit from the best minds in medicine to cure cancer for these kids. And I want to offer a special thank you here for the Peckham family, for Nancy and Michael and Lisa, who are just unbelievable supporters of Rady Children's and of our cancer center that is named in their honor. And without them, we wouldn't be where we are today with all these investigators and the science, clinician scientists and all the work that goes on, seeing these thousands of visits every year to care for the kids in our community. We also have other collaborations across uh, multiple consortia, and we want to ensure that our patients have access to life-saving care. So we are not shy at Rady Children's about partnering. We'll partner with any institution here. We also partner with St. Jude Children's Hospital, and we also partner with many consortia that, that make sure that we're collaborating on protocols to care for children. And we're going to share more about some of those details in a few moments. But I do want to highlight here our Joseph Clay's the third research center for neuro-oncology and genomics, which continues to accelerate the translation of genomic research into the personalized prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of childhood brain cancer. And a big thanks to Trulette Clay's and Brendan Holmes for their passionate support and substantial investment in funding cures for childhood cancer everywhere. In honor of her uncle, the gift actually created what you see. We have the Joseph Clay's the third neurooncology research fund, the Joseph Clay's the third endowed chair in neurooncology research, and the Joseph Clay's the third neurooncology research fellowship and education fund. So funding all across the spectrum to ensure that we can deliver cures for childhood brain cancer that you'll hear about a little bit more shortly. And at the end of the day, all of this work and all of this research and all we do, it's about outcomes and about improving the lives 
of the kids that we serve and the outcomes that we have. I'm so proud of the work that Dr. Roberts and the team, and Dr. Uh, all, the, all the doctors and, and, and staff do across our, our institution to ensure that we have these phenomenal results that you see here for all the children that we care for. And something special about pediatric cancer, we have, or pediatric treatment in general, is we have all the special care that you see and all the different uh, services, but we also have the canines, we have the family advisory councils, we even have the clowns that come through to help put a smile on the child's face. So you'll see child life services, social work services, parent liaison groups, spiritual programs, and we can't do all those programs and provide that really loving wraparound services for our children and the families without your support. So our deepest gratitude go to each and every one of you and to Padres Pedal the Cause for doing all that you do to support childhood cancer and finding cures for childhood cancer. So what I'd like to do now is just quickly introduce our, the two presenters you're gonna hear from, Drs. Bill Roberts and Dr. John Crawford. Dr. Roberts is the medical director of the Peckham Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders here at Rady Children's Hospital and Health Center. And he's the chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at the UC San Diego Department of Pediatrics. He's also, he doesn't have enough titles, so he's also the vice president and medical director of the Rady Children's Specialist of San Diego Medical Group and the clinical professor of pediatrics at UCSD School of Medicine. Dr. Robert serves as the principal investigator for the UC San Diego Rady Children's Children's Oncology Group Program and the Beat Childhood Cancer Consortium. And he's been at Rady since 1992. Then you'll hear from Dr. John Crawford, who's the director of our neuro-oncology program at Rady Children's Hospital and Health Center and the director of pediatric neuro-oncology clinical research at UCSD School of Medicine. Dr. Crawford serves as a professor of clinical neurosciences and pediatrics and as director of the Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Fellowship Program, and he's been at Rady since 2009. So thank you for your, letting me say a few words first, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Roberts now. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Frias. It's great to hear from you and to hear about the amazing care and services that Rady is providing for our kids within the oncology space and also more broadly. Um, and Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, in addition to the many duties and hats that you wear within a Rady in terms of fighting cancer, um, you also have been a tremendous steward of Padre Pedal the Cause and have been involved in um, administering the grant process over the past five years. So everyone on the line should know that, um, that Dr. Roberts does that as well. Um, and so Dr. Roberts, um, one of the things you know, Dr. Frias mentioned is that fortunately COVID-19 really hasn't impacted um, pediatric uh, patients as much as it you know, does adult patients. I wondered if you could just start by talking broadly about if COVID-19 um, is impacting cancer care and research at Rady Children's. Sure. We've um, worked very hard um, to make sure that our patients received all the care that they've needed during this uh, unprecedented time. Um, the hospital has created a safe environment for the kids, and we have worked very hard to maintain that um, so that the kids can come in and get everything that they need. We have a really strong covenant with our community because we're the only tertiary and quaternary care pediatric subspecialty facility for a region that serves about a million children. So we take that very seriously and we know that we can't close our doors and we can't be unavailable. So for everything that's an essential visit, uh, we ensured that it would happen. And in hematology oncology, most of our visits are essential. Uh, when children have cancer and they need chemotherapy, they can't have a prolonged delay. There could be a short delay if needed, um, but they need to come in and get their treatment. And so we had to remain open and, and provide that care. Uh, likewise, after we provide the treatment, we need to continue to provide supportive care like transfusions and antibiotics, and, and in other ways meet the uh, complications that can happen as a result of cancer therapy. So we quickly learned how to create uh, social distancing and uh, precautions and isolation within the clinic so that everybody could come in and be treated. And um, we're moving at full speed. We're, we're continuing to provide care. We're continuing also to uh, provide the clinical trials and the research that we were doing. Um, and uh, through everyone's hard work, uh, it has been successful and we're continuing to make sure that that success is happening. Great, that's good to hear that um care is continuing, continuing for little kids that need it so badly. 
Um, I wonder if we could shift, and um, I did mention that you've been involved with Padres Pedal for the past several years, so not only do you have great insight into the recent projects we funded, but also you have a depth and breadth over the research projects that we funded in the past. Um, so I wondered if you could talk just a little bit for our guests um, in terms of how Padres Pedal the Cause funding is really impactful and unique compared to other sources of funding. Sure, it's, it's really been highly impactful for us. Um, one of the things that, that's great about it is that it's um, a local resource. It's here from our community, the people in our community supporting the institutions in the community, and thereby supporting the children in this community. And that gives it a very homegrown feel, which is important to us. Um, one of the things that, that's been nice about that um, uh, impact for the community of San Diego is that it has brought people together um, who otherwise may not have found each other. Um, so for example, we focus pretty much exclusively in, in, on just the pediatric cancers. And there are scientists um, here, as well as at other sites in the community with whom we've been collaborating for years. And that includes UCSD and the Salk Institute and San Fran Bernard Prebis. And uh, those uh, relationships have been important. Um, but Padre's um, Pedal of the Cause has been really good at doing is um, creating uh, opportunities for new collaborations among all these institutions. So there could be, for example, a scientist um, doing basic work, uh, basic science work who hasn't really looked at specific clinical applications of it, or maybe a scientist who's working on um, uh, projects that are related to adult cancers. And by um, creating awareness of all these opportunities that exist within our communities, new collaborations have been formed uh, where uh, scientists are now looking at pediatric cancers who may not otherwise have been doing that. And that's because PEDAL is good at bringing everybody together to say, what are we going to do to have the most impact from these funds? And, and to do that well, we had to create new collaborations and create new opportunities for people to work together. And that has um, been terrific for us because we've uh, received 19 grants um, during this uh, time period. And that's really important funding for us because in many ways it's been seed funding that has allowed us to launch projects that may not have otherwise had the resources to launch or that may have taken much longer to make progress uh, without the amount of resources that these grants have provided. And bringing those new ideas to fruition is extremely important because the therapies uh, that these kids need, they need now. And, and the longer it takes for projects to develop and come to completion, the longer are the delays in bringing those uh, new rewards to the patients who need them. Excellent. And, and thank you, Dr. Roberts. I think um, you highlighted and mentioned the other three institutions that we fund. In addition to Rady Children's, we also fund the Salk Institute and Sanford Burnham Prebis, um, along with UCSD Moore's Cancer Center. So I just wanted to take a second to hit on that because um, two of our four beneficiaries are basic cancer centers, which means that they do basic research and don't always necessarily have access to clinical information, um, whereas Rady Children's and Moore's Cancer Center does have that clinical component. So as Dr. Roberts mentioned, um, Padres Pedal has always been dedicated to collaboration and bringing together different institutions um, that approach science and research in different ways. So. Um, the next question, I'd just love to hear, um, since, again, you've been involved in some of these grants um, since the beginning, and, and great to see 19 funded so far. We're not going to slow down. We're going to continue to fund more and more pediatric grants. Um, can you um, share any uh, interesting highlights on some, of the pro on some of the projects we funded in the past that stick out in terms of um, significant advances and impacts that they've made over time? Sure, it's, um, it's difficult to, to um, shrink it down to just a couple because they've all been really impactful. Um, but what I'd like to do is give um, a wide range of examples um, of, of the types of research that have benefited from this. Um, so the first one um, is uh, one that's really um, basic science laboratory mm -hmm. work um, with a direct clinical outlet. And so it's important um, uh, if we, one wants to develop uh, better treatments for cancer, um, to look at what's driving the cancer cells to grow and what's allowing them to grow. And in order to do that, um, you have to understand pathways and signaling mechanisms that happen within the cells and, and with other cells 
uh, that allow this process to happen. And the, the um, project shown on the screen right now that includes uh, Dr. Peter Zage and Tony Hunter is a good example of that. So Dr. Zage is a, a, a physician scientist, so he sees patients and he also spends time in his laboratory doing research in cancer. And Dr. Hunter is a very esteemed and accomplished um, PhD scientist. Uh, putting uh, these two together created a new synergy and Petal was, was responsible um, for providing a venue for them to do that. And so when you look at in medulloblastoma and in neuroblastoma, as they have done, looking at uh, the signaling uh, mechanisms that happen with the cells that allow them to grow, provide an opportunity to then come up with mechanisms to stop that. Because to be successful in treating cancer, you have to stop the growth. You have to stop the tumors from not only growing, but also spreading around the body. And um, understanding uh, what uh, causes them to grow allows you to create mechanisms to stop that growth. And that can happen through the use of new drugs that can be introduced into the treatments that we have. And that um, allows us to move um, the bar further. So if you go back about 60 plus years, there were very few survivors, survivors of childhood cancer. And now um, well over 80% of children diagnosed as having cancer become long-term survivors. And that sounds terrific until you think about the other almost 20% who are not surviving. And so to continue this upward movement, we have to become more and more innovative and introduce new therapies for the patients um, so that we can get better outcomes. And also we would like to be able to do it with fewer side effects and fewer toxicities and better quality of life. And that does require these sort of targeted agents um, that can kill off the cancer without causing hopefully much other disruption. So another example, I can believe on the next slide, um, looks um, way downstream of that. So Dr. Zrista Sabal and Martinez are looking um, not so much in the laboratory at doing uh, basic bench work, but are looking at a sort of a population health perspective. So as I mentioned, the, from the first project, uh, a new drug may be developed or an existing drug may find a new application in pediatric cancer. In order to bring that to fruition, one has to do clinical trials. And clinical trials are research. And so when families are presented with all the stress of a, a child with cancer and all this information they have to process about what lies ahead, having somebody come in and talk about doing research, it may sound exciting to someone who's working in the field for years and sees the promise of all this. It can be overwhelming to a family who's saying, well, I would just like my kid to be well cared for. Why are you talking to me about doing research? And they may have preconceived notions about what a clinical trial is, perhaps they think my child's going to receive a sugar pill rather than the real medicine and that that's not anything I want. Or maybe it just creates fear to say, maybe I should go somewhere else where they already know what they're doing, where they don't have to do things to figure out what the right treatment is. So to explain all the complexity of cancer treatment and developing new cancer treatments and the benefit of that, um, I'd say it's, it's overwhelming for a family who doesn't have a lot of experience in that. It's easy for those of us in the field to talk about it. If you've never dealt with it before, um, there's a lot to learn. So this research project um, focused on um, health literacy, understanding research, understanding health, and also understanding the informed consent process for research. So if people don't wanna do it, that's okay. We would never force anybody into this. Um, but when they understand it, often they see the benefit, part of the benefit for their own child and part of the benefit for the knowledge that lies ahead that will help future children and future generations. And most families will embrace that whole concept when it's presented well and they have a better understanding of it. So just as important as discovering new therapies is being allowed to use them in the clinical trial setting to, to, to understand um, how well they work and to understand the benefits of the treatment and be able to apply that more broadly to other patients as well. And so there are a lot of steps in between, types of research in between that also happen, but I thought these two nicely highlight, highlight how we're able to perform the research on a wide spectrum and, and go from drug discovery to implement, implementing therapy in patients who benefit from the therapy. Thank you. It's fascinating to see the breadth of, of the research 
um, you all are doing in collaboration with our other partners. And I, I would imagine that this second project that you hi highlight really resonates with some of our super kid families who are on the phone right now and have been through um, care at Rady and, and can directly relate to this. So I mean, these, as you mentioned, are some of the projects that we've funded over the past few years, and you've had a, a chance to take a longitudinal look at those. Um, could you comment briefly on anything I'm at a high level that you think that particularly excites you about the four recent grants we funded and, and the hope and potential that these projects have on changing outcomes for pediatric cancer patients? Sure. So in 2020, we were fortunate to uh, be able to fund four additional research projects that are just launching now. Um, and the one we're going to highlight with Dr. Crawford will be um, the next one I'll discuss briefly and then let him discuss in detail. So this is a, a very interesting uh, project and it is highly collaborative with um, people, multiple people from, from multiple centers, not only from Children's Hospital and UCSD, but Stanford Bernard Previs Institute for Medical Discovery as well. And it really um, goes uh, very quickly uh, to the patient. So taking the patient's tumor, um, understanding um, through the laboratory what's going on there, screening it for a wide variety of drugs that might be useful, and then taking a, a multidisciplinary team to look at all the data that's been created and come up with a treatment plan that in real time can be delivered to the patient. And that sort of personalized approach to cancer care is, is clearly important and it's clearly the future so that we're not um, treating everybody the same or treating everybody in the way that they need to be treated and responding in real time with information that allows us to get to that point. So Dr. Crawford can speak next in more detail about what's being done, but it, it's, it's a, a very exciting project and we're looking forward to see it come to fruition. Excellent. Um, and so with that, we will turn to Dr. Crawford. Um, this is just one of, as Dr. Met, Dr. Roberts mentioned, one of the four that we recently funded. So we, we intend to have other opportunities to hear from some of the other research project teams. Um, but one of the things that really um, jumped out about uh, this collaboration between Dr. Crawford and Dr. Alexa Rea is one, um, just the highly collaborative nature of the project where it's not only cross institution, but a lot of collaboration that's, that's happening inside at Rady, including the Genomics Institute, which we'll hear about in a few minutes. Um, I think another thing is just the personalized nature of, of the project and looking to develop personalized solutions um, for individual children is really um, cutting edge and fascinating. Uh, and, and third, why this one jumps out is because of one of our little super kids, um, Savvy Schwartz, and uh, she's pictured here, um, and I know her parents are on the line, but um, this project really relates to the organization and as a community because Savvy herself was diagnosed um, at the age of two and a half with medulloblastoma and she's been in the care um, of Rady Children's and Dr. Crawford and she's done extremely well and uh, if you saw her now I encourage you to, to see her on Facebook. She's got a ton of charisma and character um, but um, Dr. Uh, Crawford congratulations on, on being funded recently by Padres Pedal and thanks so much for being with us today. Um, I thought that we could start with just framing the discussion. Can you tell us a little bit about um, pediatric brain cancer in general, um, specifically medulloblastoma as well. Um, how does it manifest itself? How do you all detect it? How prevalent is it in this community and more broadly and just kind of frame the discussion that way? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me. Thank you for uh, Amy and Bill for, for spearheading Padre's uh, Pedal the Cause. And it really, as Dr. Roberts said, it's, a, it's an amazing collaboration with extensive talent that we have right here in our community. And I think San Diego is distinct from many communities in the country with the breadth of both clinical, basic science, translational, industry, engineering. It, it is a, a, an amazing place to, to practice medicine. Um, pediatric brain tumors are near and dear to my heart. Um, unfortunately, they're very rare, but they are the number one leading cause of death among all childhood cancer. And that's not something that we're, we're proud of. About one in 20,000 children will, will have a brain tumor. And specifically with regards to medulloblastoma, which is the most common malignant pediatric brain cancer, there are anywhere between 250 and 500 diagnoses a year in the United States. And here at Rady Children's Hospital, we see between five and 10 a year. And since I've been here in 2009, I believe we're 
somewhere between 50 and 70 patients just with medulloblastoma that, that we follow here. Uh, medulloblastoma classically is an area of the brain called the fourth ventricle in the cerebellum, which is the back part of the brain. And a lot of times these children will manifest with early morning vomiting. They start waking up, they vomit in the morning, and that generally leads to either a, a CAT scan and later magnetic resonance imaging of the brain and spine that then is followed by surgery and in many cases either high-dose chemotherapy or radiation therapy followed by chemotherapy. Thank you. Um, and so can you now talk about just, you, you, you touched on the kind of standard of care um, right there with surgery followed by chemotherapy and sometimes radiation. Um, can we start to pivot and understand the approach that you and Dr. Wexler Rea are proposing um, to improve those treatment options through this recent pilot study that we're funding? Sure. So medulloblastoma is one of these tumors that we probably know the most about when it comes to our molecular understanding of it. So we used to diagnose medulloblastoma under the microscope and there were four or five different types based on how the, the picture looked under the microscope. Now we know that medulloblastoma is at least four, if not 16 to 18 different molecular subgroups. And each one of those subgroups has associated with it certain risks of, of progression. And as I mentioned before, our therapies of surgery, chemotherapy, and in many cases, radiation therapy have led to survivals greater than 85% in many of these subgroups. However, we don't want our children to just survive, we want them to thrive. And many of the challenges that we have in our field is the late effects of therapy. We need better chemotherapies, chemotherapies that are more specific, that have less side effects, and also innovations in surgical techniques as well. So we set the bar very high. It's much higher than survival. We want our patients to live independently, go to college, and, and hopefully one day be smarter neuro-oncologists than I am. And, and I've had several patients with brain tumors that, that will be neuro-oncologists one day, which is a, a pretty amazing story. Many of them are in residency already. Um, our, our approach is really unique. I mean, just to think about when I did my fellowship, um, not too many years ago, it seems like eons, when the neurosurgeons took the tumors out, they would go down the drain. So can you imagine that all that stuff would be floating in pipes and going into the Pacific Ocean? And, and so what we've really done a great job here is collecting tissue from every patient. And it starts with having neurosurgeons that really understand the value of the tumor. And so our process really starts from the operating room with our two neurosurgeons. And we, you know, we have a bat phone type of system. When a new patient comes in, my red phone rings and pick it up. And we, 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 get, we sound the alarms with regards to all of the researchers because I don't want a single drop of this tissue wasted. Um, and, and so that's where it all starts. Now, Dr. Weschler Ray and I, we've been collaborating for about seven years now, and it really started with just that, collecting tumors from the operating room and then directly injecting them into mice and watching the tumors grow. And in general, the tumors that grew really fast correlated with how they may be growing in the patient, but we couldn't exactly correlate that. Um, but then giving these mice certain drugs to see if that would help shrink these tumors. The problem is that it takes a very long time for these tumors in mice to grow. We call them avatars. And it's not the most ideal situation. However, with our collaboration, we are one of the largest centers in the country for generating these what are called avatars or, or xenographs. But what we've done is we've, we've taken it a step further and we wouldn't have been able to do this without the Rady Children's Institute of Genomic Medicine and the Clays uh, Research Institute. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to interrogate these tumors at a very, very high level. 
So I mentioned before where you can look at it under the microscope and make a diagnosis. Well, now we're doing basically a shotgun approach, which is dissecting these molecules, looking at DNA and RNA and what's called methylation, a coding of the DNA. And then more, more recently, we've been able to do drug screening. And what that means is that means that the tumor comes from the operating room. It's put in a suspension of fluid. It's pipetted on these plates that have hundreds and hundreds of drugs that we can use clinically. And these cells are incubated. The patient's own tumor cells are incubated. And then we do what are called cell viability assays to determine whether or not these particular drugs are effective for the patient's tumor. And this together with this very complex set of what were called bioinformatics come together in two settings. One of them is our clinical neuro-oncology tumor board where we talk about the nuts and bolts and the standard of the care therapies. But we merge that with what's called the molecular neuro-oncology tumor board where there are participants made up from all over San Diego and all over the country actually to discuss these patients' results. And hopefully what we're going to be able to do is come up with an individualized treatment plan based on all of the results, not just the drug screening, but this multi-omics analysis to bring it back to the patient. And one of the, the challenges in the past has been how long does it take to get the information back. So children that have recurrent medulloblastoma that, that fail standard of care therapy, we don't have six months or a year to wait for all this genetic and genomics to come back. But we're fortunate enough because of innovative technologies, many of them have been discovered right here with Dr. Kingsmore with the rapid whole genome sequencing. We're gonna be able to get these results back within three weeks, which today I'll say three weeks is too long but remember how long it took to sequence the whole genome, right? Years. So things are getting faster, but we're finally at the point where our patients deserve this. They really do. They deserve individualized patient care. And we're finally going to be able to, to do this thanks to the Padres the Pedal the Cause grant. Wow. That's um, super exciting and, and also a little bit complex, but thank you for um, uh, providing this diagram and walking it, uh, walking us through this at a easy level to understand. Um, can you talk about how you originally developed the partnership with Dr. Wexler Rea and, and kind of his background and what that brings to the table? Sure. So I can tell you that pediatric and pediatric cancer in general is a very collaborative community, and certainly within neuro oncology, it's it's no different. Um, we are all friends with each other. There are no egos in this room or any other neuro-oncology room, and we all work together. So when I first found out that Dr. Wexler Rea came to San Diego, which was about a year after me, we had coffee right outside Rady Children's Hospital and talked about how are we going to cure medulloblastoma, and then several 2 a.m. phone calls over the course of a couple of years. We went from a discussion to a seamless transfer of tissue from the operating room to his lab. And then now we have operating room, not only to his lab, but through to Rady Children's Institute of Genomic Medicine and other labs all across the country and world to be able to utilize newer technologies to help our patients. So Potter's Petal um, just funded you all for some, some seed funding to explore this pilot, pilot trial. Can you talk about the short-term goals of this research project and then the picture more broadly of in, in the long term, what could success really mean for medulloblastoma patients and perhaps other pediatric cancer patients? Sure. So I think, you know, I, I said there are no egos in this room, but we all want to be the first at something, right? And so I think this approach that we're taking with the real-time drug screening, we are going to be the first in the nation to be able to provide this for our patients in a clinical trial setting, which is really phenomenal. So essentially part one is, is a feasibility. Can we do this? Can we send tissue to all of these different laboratories? Can we get the information back and discuss it together as a group? 
can we come up with a combination of drugs that can be safely given to children? And lastly, can we do it in a rapid time period so that we can help these patients? So that is essentially the goal of this project. And there are certainly many challenges and many barriers with regards to how drugs get into the brain. However, I think this approach could be the backbone for the future of pediatric brain cancer therapy. Um, that is awesome. Um, I know that uh, it, it, would it be possible that this approach, it's obviously highly personalized and you talked about all the different subsets even within medulloblastoma. Um, is this something that could be used for other pediatric cancer types beyond medulloblastoma and brain tumors, or do you see this really being focused on brain cancers? Absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. Yes, it absolutely can be translated to other cancers. And, and one of the things that I should note, I was talking about technology. We are fortunate enough to have this million dollar robotic system called ROSA, which with a fine needle, one can actually gather tissue from very eloquent areas of the brain that previously were do not touch areas. And through these needles, there are cores of tissue that can be used for drug screening for all of this molecular analysis. So one doesn't need large chunks of, of tumor to be able to do this. And so this can tr translate across all different tumor types. And that's exactly what we want to do is we want to utilize this for our most malignant cancers for which we have no standard therapies and no cure. Wow. Well, so this is, our role has been to provide seed funding for this. And so I think that you've done a great pitch on how impactful this project could be in the short term and the long term. And, and our call to action, of course, is to raise more money so we can continue to learn about the outcomes of your research and to con con continue to fund it. So. Um, thank you very much for um, taking the time to um, share a little bit more about this project. At this point, I'm going to open it up to Q&A from the audience. And so I'm going to stop here the screen share for just a second um, so we can, can see each other. And let's see. Um, so a couple of questions have um, come in. Um, you mentioned that you were able to get tissue samples in collaboration with other hospitals all over the country. Can you touch on how that type of collaboration is started and how that would work? Sure. So there are um, several organizations within the country. There are uh, a variety of pediatric brain tumor cancer centers that, that house molecular information and tumor genetic information. And, and we are Part, part of one of those centers. And, and essentially, we have a numerous amount of, of information that's all electronic. And then these will have to go into these supercomputers that get stored onto servers. And basically, they're shared with the community. So all of the information that we upload, that we provide, is shared with institutions across the world. Excellent. Um, okay, another question, and this one is from Jonathan Schwartz. I mean, can ROSA be used in other parts of the body and not just the brain? For example, other harder areas and more delicate areas, such as the spine? Yeah, the, the spine is, is a little tricky because of the nature of the vertebral bodies and the bony structures surrounding the spine. Um, however, I, I do see one day that that technology may play a role. Right now, it's still a needle that can go in a very dangerous place. And certainly, you, the spinal cord can be very unforgiving at times. And the amount of tissue that we would have to take may be a little challenging. But I do see a time where either the technology advances where we can do that, or we can collect lumbar puncture fluid that's much safer to be able to perform genomic analysis, very similar to a biopsy if we're able to collect it from the spinal fluid itself. Thank you. Uh, another technical question here. Is Rady implementing liquid biopsies for identification of key biomarkers of glioblastomas or blood cancers? Yeah, so the, the field of the liquid biome is one that's, that's rapidly evolving. And 
the, the one example that, that we have is we, we were part of a study looking at one of the most malignant brain cancers in childhood called the, the mid diffuse midline glioma, where there is a genomic marker for this tumor that potentially can be collected in the blood. However, it's not perfect. And there are false negatives, meaning that the sample could be negative from the blood and there could still be active tumor. So it is definitely an emerging technology. And we hope that one day we'll be able to just collect blood samples, not only for ongoing care of pediatric brain tumor patients, but also for early diagnosis and early detection before these tumors even grow. Because we know that that would be the best time to hit this with chemotherapy or radiation before they get a chance to grow. Um, I also had a question around, I noticed that this pilot trial is specifically focused at relapse or refractory patients. Can you describe why that is? Is that just due to the, the, the funding right now or for other reasons? No, I think, you know, it's something that, that we, had, we had talked about initially. Uh, medulloblastomas, there are a variety of subtypes and we know that some of them based on their molecular profile are more likely than not to behave very aggressively in spite of standard chemotherapy and radiation therapy. However, we chose to do recurrent medulloblastoma because as of now, aside from chemo and radiation, there's really no standard of care, standard of care cure for recurrent or refractory medulloblastoma. And we felt that, that given that, this is an ideal community and an ide ideal tumor type for us to start this project. Okay. And then uh, kind of similar, but is this only, or are, are only patients treated at radius eligible, eligible for being part of this trial? If others are interested in participating, would that be possible? That's, that's correct. So, so when, when the clinical trial is completed and submitted to the Institutional Review Board, it's open for everybody. It's posted on a national database, www.clinicaltrials.gov, and there will be patients from all over the world that would be interested in, in this study. However, it is going to be a pilot study, so there will be a limited number of patients that we're going to start in, in the first phase. Great. Uh, we, got, we have another question here. Is your tissue repository available to scientists science investigations. I'm sorry, I missed the, the last part. Is your tissue repository available to scientists for basic science investigations? Yes, yeah, so our, our tissue repository uh, is available, number one, within the community. So within the community with collaborations with us, they're able to acquire that tissue. And then number two, we also are part of a larger registry where our, our, not just the tissue, but the bioinformatics gets deposited. And this is freely available. And as I had mentioned before, we have mice that have been created in Dr. Wexler Reyes lab that have literally been around the world. So it is very, very collaborative. That is exciting. Well, um, this is great. I, I think we have touched on Oh, wait, we have another question here. How long does this tissue stay viable and would you rerun it to test against new drugs as they're developed? So one of the limitations of the drug screening is that there is a, a finite amount of time and one can't freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw cells. It really has to be done more real time. The other genomics analysis can be done on either frozen tissue or tissue that is placed in wax that will last for decades. So it really just depends on what type of bioinformatics we're, we're using. Great, thank you. So um, another question, Dr. Frias, have you started training for Padres Pedal de Cause 2021? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> times a week. <laughs> okay, so all of uh, it looks like um, our, all of our questions have been addressed so far. So um, if anyone has any other ones, please share those. Um, I do want to take a second um, to just make some closing remarks and to give some um, some thank yous. So um, 
first off, I mean, thank you to all of you at Rady Children's for um, making time to be with us today uh, and for everything you do to keep um, pediatric cancer patients and just all of the children in, in San Diego that you serve safe. Um, we, we love the partnership with you all from the research component, from conversations like this, also from our Super Kid program that really makes this so meaningful. Um, so thank you. Um, also to highlight DD, who is our presenting sponsor today, and to some of the other sponsors, WD40, um, Thermo Fisher Scientific, who is involved in the space of making some of this technology and many others. Um, we pride ourselves on donating 100% on of participant fundraising dollars to the mission, and the only way we're able to do that um, is through sponsors like this. So thank you. Um, and and I think with that, um, you know, everyone is curious around. Uh, what, what is the future of, of big group gatherings and events? And I can just say that we are busy as an organization working with um, to it, I identify and confirm a date for next spring. Um, we are not going to stop fundraising. We're going to continue to train and to raise money and to honor people we know that have been touched by cancer so we can continue to fund research like that that we just heard about today. So um, thank you again. We will send this recording out um, and look forward to seeing you all uh, as soon as we can. Thank you, Ann. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye.